All right, Ecclesiastes for Beginners, the, the name of the class. Uh, this is lesson 10 in that series. The title of this lesson, Qualities of a Wise Leader. Qualities of a Wise Leader. And we'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter eight if you're following along in your Bibles. So we've said the, that uh, beginning in chapter seven, Solomon begins to ponder on those things that show his journey back to God. He's on his way back to God. Uh, he no longer is exploring and writing about the various experiences and pursuits of, uh, of worldly living, you know, living under the sun, which have left him unfulfilled and depressed. Now he turns his attention to the fruit of wisdom and the good things in life that he will ultimately admit can only come from a life that is lived under the sovereignty um, and uh, the blessings of, of God. So far in this journey back to God, he's uh, given several proverbs that describe true wisdom, true wisdom from above, and how one's life can be enriched if he or she truly applies um, this wisdom to life. Uh, for example, uh, that wisdom provides strength and balance and insight. So far, his proverbs, so far his thinking has led him to this conclusion that the wisdom from above can provide strength, balance and insight for one's life here on earth. So in chapter eight and chapter nine, he's going to continue this line of thinking by discussing the qualities of good leaders uh, three different subjects actually. The qualities of good leaders, mysteries that cannot be solved, uh, and also the importance of developing a proper philosophy of life. Three different topics that he's going to tackle in the next, uh, uh, next couple of uh, verses. So we begin with the qualities of a wise leader. Although it is usually the result of hard work and talent, not all leaders who achieve this role are qualified for their jobs. And we know that, a couple of examples of this. Uh, some are promoted beyond their capabilities. Somebody actually wrote a book, a book about this phenomenon called the Peter Principle. In other words, some people are just one step higher than they need to be uh, you know, in, in, in their work or in their career and so they are incompetent at the level that they find themselves at. You know how it works, a fellow's a good manager uh, and because he's a good manager they promote him and he goes up to another level and he does well at that level, they keep promoting him and he does well and then finally they promote him one more time and this time he gets to a level where he really, you know, he's beyond himself, he's beyond his capabilities. And, and, and we know it's hard to work for people like this because they are uninspiring, they cause resentment among their followers because everybody usually knows that they're out of their depth. You know, they were good at this level and then they got promoted beyond their capability. That's the, uh, that's the Peter principle. The solution is usually to delegate to a well-formed team or to go back to a better service level, but very few people you know, go back to another service level where they feel competent. They want to keep that position. And then there are some who are just egotistical and intolerant of lesser talented people. Some people at the top, some people who have made it have that particular attitude. These kind of hard driving types think everybody else should be like them or no one else can be like them. You know, ego is all uh, you know, what it's about. They push too hard and usually don't appreciate the people who work for them. So you have different kinds of bosses that are uh, difficult to work for. Now there are a lot of other types, but these two are simply examples of leaders who have the position, but not the character that the position of leadership requires. That's the point that I want to make to you know, build up to, our, uh, to the passage that we're going to talk about. So Solomon, who was a leader, provides five key characteristics that leaders should have in order to be not just qualified leaders, but qualified godly leaders. So first uh, qualification, godly leaders should have a clear mind. Chapter one, uh, chapter eight, or rather verse one a says, who is like the wise man and who knows the interpretation of a matter? The word interpretation means the solution. 
the solution to a matter. So Solomon says that good leaders are able to see through problems to the solution. They don't only see the problem, they're able to uh, you know, envisage what kind of solution is required. Um, a good leader's mind is not cluttered with unresolved issues and you know, changing values. He uh, or she can see clearly to the bottom line because good leaders have set values and references to help them make consistent decisions. You know, he, a good leader is not making different decisions based on a different set of values. That causes confusion. A good leader has a set of values from which they make decisions. And so people can anticipate from them the kind of leadership that they will provide. So a leader's clear mind helps him lead without confusion and without hesitation. Another uh, quality, uh, characteristics of a godly leader. A godly leader has a cheerful disposition. A man's wisdom, Solomon says, uh, illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. Uh, in other words, a cheerful heart is reflected in a person's face. He has a positive and happy look. He has a yes face. You know, if you never had bosses or superiors that had a no face, you didn't even have to ask them anything. The answer was no. You know, it was written on their face. Nothing is more difficult than serving under a person that has no sense of humor or no ability to see perhaps the silliness in a situation or even silliness in self. Uh, a great leader deals seriously with the issues of leadership but doesn't take himself too seriously. A third quality or characteristic of a godly leader is a discreet tongue. Uh, he says in uh, chapter eight, verse two, I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil manner, uh, matter, for he will do whatever he pleases, since the word of the king is authoritative. Who will say to him, what are you doing? So a discreet tongue. Solomon is speaking here primarily to subordinates, okay? Not speaking about the leader, but the subordinates, saying that they should be loyal to their leaders and obey them because they can make life difficult for you. But in a, an indirect way, he's also telling leaders that they can best inspire loyalty and obedience in their subordinates if they have a discreet mouth. You know, leaders who exercise their authority with tact and sensitivity and compassion usually receive the, benef the benefit of supportive followers. So yes, followers have to kind of submit to the leaders, be willing to cooperate and you know, to, to give him their best. But leaders you know, have to have a way of leadership uh, that recognizes the needs of their subordinates, that recognizes their strengths and weaknesses, their different characters, so on and so forth. So a good leader has a discreet tongue. Number four, characteristics of godly leaders, uh, keen judgment, keen judgment. Good leaders show that they have the type of skills and attitude that enables them to make a judgment call that we rely on leaders to make in a difficult situation. It's not always cut and dry. Sometimes you know, there's a judgment call that has to be made. There's a, we have a choice between three things, three things that look equally possible. That's where we rely on the leaders to make a judgment call. We want them to have experience and insight to be able to make those decisions. So Solomon describes some of the features that enable one to have this keen judgment that enables them to make good good calls. In verse 5a he says, he who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble. In other words, uh, he knows his place. He is secure in his leadership, who knows that the call is his to make. The royal command means put in a position of leadership by God to make decisions. The one who keeps the royal command. In other words, I've been you know, uh, ordained by God or I've been appointed by the, uh, by the committee, whatever it is, I know that I have the authority to make the decision that I uh, need to make. Uh, there's no dithering, there's no wondering, if you wish. There's no hesitation here. It doesn't experience any trouble in exercising his leadership through decision making. Uh, 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 chapter eight, verse five, B and six, he says, 
for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure, for there is a proper time and procedure for every delight, though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. So the leader also knows the right time and the right procedure in which things need to be decided and carried out. Sometimes it's not just one decision, sometimes it's a series of decisions that have to be made in the proper order in order to get the correct result. Uh, uh, um, uh, a person who has keen judgment knows the order of the decisions. He remains calm also in making these decisions, even under pressure, even when there's trouble. Isn't that what we want in, in our leaders? It's kind of easy to make decisions when you've got all day to make them, no pressure, you can consult 20 people, but when you're under a deadline or when you're you know, in, in a military situation, military commanders have to make split second decisions while under fire. You know? And so a, a, a godly leader in that sense is able to make decisions while under, under pressure. Verse seven, if no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? In other words, he's tuned in to the attitude and the needs of his followers. Even though others don't know what is going to happen, good leaders can discern the right timing for their decisions for the future. And in the end, isn't that what we want leaders to, to do? Uh, isn't, isn't that what we want them to have? The ability to have vision for the future, to make decisions now which will impact the group, the company, the church, the whatever, you know, whatever it is, will impact that group in the future. That's what you want from a leader. Well, a godly leader, Solomon says, is able to make decisions that will impact the future. And so leaders gain and maintain loyalty and credibility by making good decisions based on keen judgment. Now remember, we're talking about the, uh, the qualities of a godly leader, so keen judgment, that's one of the qualities. Another one is a humble spirit, Ecclesiastes 8.8. 8. He says, no man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind or authority over the day of death, and there is no discharge in the time of war and evil will not deliver those who practice it. So despite great skill and advantages, it's important for leaders to recognize their limitations and their mistakes. Uh, truly wise leaders are truly humble leaders who can take direction from the Lord above and advice from those below. This guarantees his position with God and not only the loyalty, but the love and the respect of his followers. So Solomon ends the section with two warnings against arrogant and proud leaders. He says, God will judge those who take unfair advantage of those you know, uh, in their charge and leaders who do take advantage of their followers really hurt themselves more than they hurt those who are under them. And so he's talked about you know, qualities of good leaders. He, go, he, he goes to another topic, another subject now, and those are mysteries. So after reviewing the qualities, some of the qualities of good and godly leaders, he discusses what he calls mysteries that defies even his own wisdom. Now when Solomon discusses things he cannot understand, he means things he cannot understand without God's help things he cannot understand without God's revelation. You know, some things you know, we, we don't understand because we have not yet discovered them in the Bible yet. We're, we're, you know, we're, uh, we're immature. Other things we don't understand because God has not revealed them to us yet, right? I mean, uh, 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 the, the, the problem, uh, not the problem, but the, w when is Jesus returning? Well, we don't know that. We can give that issue a whole lot of thought and we can consult the Bible and keep reading it over and over, but we don't know that. And until God reveals that to us, we don't know it. So Solomon is saying, so there are some things we just don't know and don't understand. And also there are some things we don't understand because they will always be beyond us. So, the thing we don't know now, you know, when will Jesus return? You know, we'll know that one day. Or what is heaven like? Well, we know a little bit of what that is, but one day we'll know, we'll know that completely because we'll be in heaven with God. But some things we'll never know, like the total wisdom of God. We will never know that. We will never be able to know that. All the things that God has done, all the things that God is, we'll never, we'll never be able to know that because we're not His equal. 
All right. So in chapters 8, 10 to 17, Solomon describes three mysteries which are simply beyond his knowledge and can only, under, can only be understood with the help of God's revelation. So the first one of these is the triumph of the unjust. In other words, the mystery of the unjust triumphing. How come unjust people win? That's one mystery. And he says in chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, so then I have seen the wicked buried, those who go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This too is futility, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly. Therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear Him openly but it will not be well for the evil man and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. So you know, religious hypocrites who attend worship but who are evil people, you know, he talks about going in and out of the temple. When they die, they receive nice funerals, he says, and they're preached into heaven. In addition to this, those who build a nice life for themselves at the expense of other people and they're, not, they're never punished for it here on earth. Solomon says that without swift justice, it encourages others to do the same. And he doesn't understand God's tolerance of this kind of evil and hypocrisy. Why is it that bad people have great lives, pleasurable lives, long lives, and then they die at peace at sleep? You know, that doesn't seem fair, he says. This is one of the mysteries of life. Another mystery, um, the mystery of unfair consequences, verse 14. He says, there is futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility. In other words, why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? You know, the first question was, why do people just get away with stuff? and God doesn't punish them. This question is different. Why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? You know, missionaries, uh, you know, a modern day example, those who want to work in missions, want to go in foreign fields, they have to scrape by and, and they're often persecuted while evil leaders live long lives in luxury. Uh, you know, I mean, people who served as missionaries you know, for, the, for the church uh, living in Cuba, had a hard time. Many of them were thrown into jail and suffered, while Castro lived in luxury you know, until he was like 90 years old or something, and he had a state funeral. That, you know, there's, it's not fair. Or drunk drivers who walk away with only a scratch from an accident that kills perhaps a young mother and, and two of her children. You know, why, why is it that a good thing, you know, that he, the drunk walked away from the accident, it happens to him, and a bad thing happens to the innocent mom and the children. So Solomon looks at these everyday occurrences and he's puzzled as to the why a good and loving God allows things like this to happen. And I mean, don't we ask ourselves the same things today? Nothing new there. Imagine, even Solomon had no answer for this question. I mean, the wisest man that ever lived had no answer, no ready answer for this issue of why bad things happen to good people and why good things happen to bad people. And then the third question, the untimely pleasure. In other words, the mystery of untimely pleasure. Verse 15, so I commended pleasure for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. So despite the mysteries and the ironies of life, there are good moments that come and many times unexpected moments, even unearned moments of pleasure and prosperity. Solomon's response to the first two mysteries is to encourage his readers to take advantage of the third mystery, you know, the unexpected, the unexpected blessings of life when they come or unearned blessings of life when they come. This is not the answer to all of life's problems, but a way of helping us from becoming too skeptical and pessimistic and angry, which could lead to a loss of faith. Yeah, there's 
you know, the, the bad people get away with all kinds of things. And yes, bad things happen to good people, but good things happen to bad, yeah, all that is true. But aren't there just good things that happen to us in life at times? Aren't we blessed for no reason? Don't we receive things that we didn't work for? Doesn't that happen to everybody once in a while? Solomon says, you know, just <laughs> accept the good things that take place in your life without looking too far to try to solve these other mysteries. In the final verses of the chapter, verses 16 and 17, let's read that. He says, when I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. So in the final uh, verses of the chapter, Solomon concludes that there are limits to what a person can understand without God's help, even for a wise man. Even a wise man needs God's help in order to understand certain things in life. All right, so now that Solomon um, uh, is journeying back to God, in his discussion about true wisdom and good leadership and the limits of his own wisdom, he begins to construct a view of life that he should have had from the beginning. Now he's tried so many avenues that have led nowhere. Now he's turning to God and he begins to see the way that a wise man truly should go. You know, he tried to go one way, experimenting on his own, under the sun, away from God, and all of that led him to disappointment and disillusionment. Now he's, he's, he's making a life construct, taking God into, consider, un, into consideration. So it's the same with us today. A lot of people try a variety of lifestyles or life philosophies before uh, we find the, the narrow way, as Jesus says, find the narrow way, as it were. Uh, the true way that one should live. So in chapter nine, Solomon makes a, a break from his past and he begins to describe a new philosophy of life, this time a philosophy of life based on faith. And we see this change in verse 1a where he acknowledges that he has taken to heart and reviewed all the ways and now has found God's way, meaning you know, he's taken to heart to explain it. He's going to explain the things that he has experienced and that he has learned. So in the following verses, he goes on to describe a life philosophy that is based on faith and obedience to God. Thing, uh, excuse me, this life plan, he says, has four key truths and four key applications to guarantee a godly and rewarding life. So let's begin with truth number one, according to Solomon. God is sovereign. He says, for I have taken all this to my heart, meaning I, I've examined everything, okay? And, and, and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God, are in the hand of God. Whether good or bad happens in your life, God is in control of everything. Men cannot know what will happen, but God does know. That's the implied idea. When your foundation in life is a sovereign God, you can deal with the good and the bad because even if you're not in control, you know that someone is in control. God is in control. Truth number two, death is certain. Verse two and three A. It is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good and for the clean and for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Yeah, knowing for sure that no matter who you are and what you do, you will die, allows you to keep a perspective in life and time. The fact that you're going to die, that we're all going to die, helps us keep a perspective on things. We understand pretty much how long we're going to be here. We understand the phases of life. We understand for sure that life will end here. That helps us understand who to look for, how we should live, what we should do, 
uh, it helps us to value things. And it also forces us to make priorities and be more careful in what we do. It also motivates us to seek for God. If we die, we want to know what happens after death and the only person who knows that for sure is God. And so it, it, it moves us to seek God. Truth number three, the heart is evil. He says, furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. The heart is evil. There is no personal progress until a person finally acknowledges his basic sinfulness and need for redemption. Until you know, a person says, my heart is evil, there's no change possible. I mean, this is the first step in every recovery type program, the acknowledgement of whatever it is, the acknowledgement of I'm a sinner, I'm an alcoholic, I'm, I'm overweight, I, I'm a shopaholic, you know, the acknowledgement of sin, the acknowledgement of evil, of failure in our life. A person cannot enjoy peace and joy without forgiveness and grace. And these things only come with an awareness of sin, which is painful. But it's necessary in order to get to the peacefulness and to the, uh, to the forgiveness. Uh, truth number four, where there is life, there is hope. For whoever is joined with all the living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion, for the living know they will die. But the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. So where there's life, there's hope. In Solomon's day, dogs were not pets. They didn't keep, people didn't keep dogs as pets. They were mongrels, they were wild. But lions, on the other hand, lions were prized as royal animals. So what he's saying is that it's better to live poor and dishonored than have great honor and praise but be dead. And of course, why? Because the living have hope for tomorrow, but the dead are gone. His point is that while you are alive, make the most of the present. You have no guarantee of the future. And of course, doesn't Jesus repeat this in the in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, to live one day at a time. So his basic philosophy of faith is a sovereign Lord, acknowledgement of the existence of sin and death, and the wisdom of taking advantage of each day has set up the basis of his new philosophy and his new approach in life. He now ends the section with some very practical applications that this new lifestyle will produce in the everyday life, not only in his everyday life, but in the everyday life of every individual who orders his own life in the same way. So four applications to the four truths. Application number one, contentment, verse seven. Go then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. So if God is sovereign, if as a sinner you are reconciled uh, to, uh, to, to God and your life is a short, you know, a short span, he says, enjoy what God gives you, whatever that is. Christians often feel you know, guilty for enjoying their blessings, but prosperity is only a sin when we gain it in evil ways, or we fail to give thanks for it, or we fail to share it with those who are in need. But if we give thanks for the good things that God has given us, if we properly share with others who are in need, in whatever way we do that, we, we should rejoice in our, in, our, in our prosperity. Give thanks for it. Let it bless us. Why? Well, because God's the one who's provided it. The only difference between you know, a rich Christian and, 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 and a rich atheist, let's say, is that the, the rich Christian knows where his wealth comes from and gives thanks for it, and the rich atheist does neither. It thinks his wealth or her wealth you know, uh, comes from his own hand and gives thanks to nobody uh, for it. Uh, number two application, purity and spirituality. Verse eight, let your clothes be white, all the time 
and let not oil be lacking on your head. So clothing represented purity and oil represented the work of the Spirit of God in your life. So if your life is based on this philosophy, then your life will be purified of its evil and the Spirit of God will lead you through His word, obviously. In our, in our time, the Spirit of God leads us through His word, through the church. Right? That's how God interacts with us. Application number three, faithfulness, verse nine. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which she has given to you under the sun, for this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. The man with a thousand wives, that's Solomon, the man with a thousand wives concedes an intimate relationship with one woman is the way to satisfaction and joy. The world offers all kinds of methods and ways to find sexual and intimate satisfaction, but God's way is still the only way that this can be fully achieved. One man, one woman, faithfully living together for life. And then application number four, Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in shale where you are going. So application number four is zeal. Now that the searching for life's uh, true meaning is over, Solomon says a person can really kind of get into their work and get into their family and get into their passion, whatever their passion is. Life is short, so we mustn't wait until tomorrow to do what must be done today. If you figured out that God is God and that you, you, you're a sinner and you need His forgiveness and you need His help and you need Him to sustain you from day to day, if you figured that out and have acted upon that, then Solomon is saying, stop wasting time you know, wondering what should I do. Just you know, get into your life, get into your family, you know, whatever your passion is, follow that because you have, you have uh, found the proper, um, uh, the proper uh, uh, goal of life. You found the proper pattern uh, that life needs to be based upon, that there is a God, that you are His servant, that you are a sinner, that He has forgiven you, that Christ is your Lord. You know, if you figured that out, that's good. That's good. Now live your life. Don't be afraid to live your life because you've figured out the most important elements of your life. So Solomon shows us that only when we've settled in our minds some of the basics of what life is really about, uh, that we can truly begin to live our lives and enjoy it. That's why people you know, many times who ignore the Bible, ignore church for themselves and their families, they miss out on so much. They're always searching and seeking, not satisfied. And so Solomon is saying, it's possible to be satisfied under the sun, but that satisfaction does not come from acquiring or doing. That satisfaction comes from knowing knowing that there is a God and obeying that God and living for that God. Only then can you enjoy the life that He's given you under the sun. Okay, so that's our lesson number 10, qualities of a wise leader and other topics. We will continue this class uh, next time. Thank you, for your, uh, thank you for your attention.